Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the organizers and uh, all of you for, for joining us today. It's a, a real honor to talk this morning, to open things up. Uh, I want to, at the outset, uh, thank Tim Lehman and the National Geographic Society for the chance to use a lot of the images that I'm going to uh, be showing us today. Let's talk about mammals for a little while. The island of New Guinea, the world's largest tropical island, sits just to the north of the Australian country. And uh, I had just turned 21 years old when I first uh, went up to New Guinea. I had finished my undergraduate studies. I had taken up studying with, with Professor Tim Flannery here down in Adelaide. Now, Tim took a fairly casual approach to sending me up to New Guinea for the first time. Uh, I went up on my own, 21. Uh, I had very little in the way of contacts, and I went, if you were to throw a dart at the map of the island of New Guinea, right in the dead center of it, right near the border between West Papua and PNG, uh, are the Star Mountains, and that's, that's where I went. I was off looking for lost species of giant rats. And it's been almost two decades later, it didn't take me that long to realize there's a lot more to planning work in New Guinea uh, than that sort of approach, but that was before we did risk assessments and all the rest. But an extraordinary jewel of a place. What drew me to a place like New Guinea was the extraordinary mammal fauna. I had grown up as a, a teenager reading things like National Geographic magazine and reading Tim Flannery's books about these fantastic adventures discovering new species of, of mammals. Mammals, even in, in the 21st century or late 20th century in New Guinea, like tree kangaroos, this kind of animal. Or the world's largest monotremes, egg-laying mammals, like this long-beaked echidna up here in the western part of New Guinea. And I did that for about 10 years as a PhD student and afterwards, very concerted efforts to start to explore, building on those first initial early efforts and um, continuing expanding the work into some of the least explored corners of the island of New Guinea. And so at first that involved small expeditions, hiking in, and as we uh, got better and, and more uh, savvy about things, we were um, landing teams in helicopters into places like this, the Foja Mountains of Western Papua, one of the least explored tropical corners of our planet. This is a mountain range about 100 kilometers across that rises about uh, 7,000 feet up into the sky, uh, where, as far as we knew, no one, no scientists had ever gone to see what mammals lived in places like this. This was, this was, uh, these were heady days. This was some of the most amazing kind of thrill discovery of my life, working in uh, these tented camps, setting up, um, setting up spaces to work in areas where, as far as we knew, um, not just no scientists, but in some cases no people perhaps had ever set foot. Extraordinary places to get in and for the first time perhaps document the tropical richness, the rich biodiversity of environments like an isolated tropical montane rainforest in New Guinea. So tented camps, um, isolated field areas where we were setting up traps and other ways to try to cleverly figure out what was living in forests like this. And many of you have done work like this, basic biodiversity work, where you take a, a simple thing like a live trap, you put it down on the forest floor, you come back a little later and you see what you've caught. In this case, places like New Guinea, nocturnal animals, and you'd go in the early evening, set up a trap line, lay it out, and in the morning go back, just like you see here, take a peek inside. But think about it, the thrill of a place like the Foja Mountains, the chance to maybe look into a trap like that and in a case like this, maybe see a kind of animal that not just no scientist, but maybe even no person has ever taken a look at before in a place this isolated and uninhabited. So that's the thrill I'm talking about, the chance to get into some corners of the world like this and, and see what's there. And we use camera traps too. Uh, some of you have probably seen these pictures before. I'm showing some of my favorite mammals. This too is from the Foja Mountains. So not just traps, live traps on the ground, um, but camera traps set up in the forest. This is about a decade ago, working up in one of these isolated mountain ranges. And imagine coming back, checking your camera, and seeing that this animal and this tree kangaroo has taken a look in it overnight. So this species is called Dendrolagus pulcherimus. Dendrolagus are the tree kangaroos. Pulcherimus, if you remember some of your Latin, actually means most beautiful. 
This is the most beautiful tree kangaroo, an apt name, and it was named and discovered scientifically by Tim Flannery only in the 1990s. And at the time that we took these pictures, we only actually knew that this species lived in another mountain range several hundreds of kilometers away in the next country over, PNG. Here we are in West Papua, and we documented living in this area an overlooked population of this critically endangered species. But what a beautiful animal. We learn little bits and pieces about the lives of these animals with these little bits of detective work. Here it is, taking a look into the camera. It raises its head, looks up. Look at the markings on this animal. Backs up a little, you see that beautiful tail. And ultimately it chooses a different way to cross over on this log bridge where we found it. But it's a chance, when working in places like New Guinea, to work with some of the most remarkable people on our planet as well. People that know their environments um, like we probably never would or will. People that are in so many ways just like us but live lives that we would find very hard to recognize. Extraordinary people. And it's education like this, hunting with um, men especially in forests in, in Papua New Guinea and West Papua that taught me so much more about uh, the wildlife of these areas than I ever would have been able to learn uh, from books or from museum specimens or from the other traditional ways that we learn about these things. Extraordinary educations in places like these. And Along the way, uh, we've turned up things that have been not seen previously by scientists, things that didn't have scientific names, and I'm just going to show you a very few of my favorites. This is an animal called um, the blue-eyed spotted cuscus a species that's found only in western New Guinea on a little oceanic island fragment off the coast of, of New Guinea, nowhere else. It has these gorgeous blue eyes and a beautiful spotted pattern on the coat. We named this species a few years ago. Species that doesn't even have a scientific name yet. Working with a crew from the BBC, we went to a study in an extinct volcano in south central Papua New Guinea, one of the most extraordinary landforms uh, on the south side of the big mountains in, in PNG, a place called Mount Basavi, uh, rising up out of lowland forests, up on the top of these cloud forests, an absolutely isolated world where we wanted to be the first to go in and see what mammals were there. This is one of the world's largest true rats, very close closely related to the kinds of rats that live in cities and sewers, but uh, evolving for millions of years on its own in this isolated environment in New Guinea, uh, about a meter long, this species only found in this isolated extinct volcanic crater. Another one of my favorites, this takes us out into the Pacific Theater, the oceans, um, great oceans spanning off of the New Guinea coast. Uh, out into the Solomon Archipelago lives one of the largest bats in the world. This is called the Greater Monkey-Faced Bat. It has a larger set of jaws and teeth than any other bat on our planet. It can break open things like thick-skinned fruits and coconuts. Uh, and we didn't realize that it, that it even existed, that it needed a scientific name until about 2005. This is perhaps the most critically endangered species of mammal uh, in the Solomon Islands, and it's only now that we have a scientific name for it that we've added it to, um, added to things like the IUCN Red List to country protected lists, and we've initiated surveys and grant funded uh, projects to learn uh, more about it. But, Take a pause for a minute. How is it that arguably one, you know, the largest bat in the world um, has to wait until the 21st century to get its scientific name for us to even learn the very first thing about it? This is a clue, and we really need to acknowledge and realize this, as you'll see, um, how little we really do know about the natural world. We might imagine that we can pick up all the books off of the shelf or um, type things into to Google and Wikipedia and find what we need to know about organisms like this, but the truth is uh, we cannot do that. Uh, there's an extraordinary amount of biodiversity that remains unknown. The, actually, the grand majority of life on Earth remains unknown. Some of us know this is an ac in an academic sense, but it's very easy to forget, especially for animals like vertebrates. This is E.O. Wilson and his book, recent book, Half Earth. Um, talking, speaking to the best science out there on estimating how much of the planet we know so far. And we're talking, yes, about microbial diversity, arthropod diversity like insects and deep sea organisms, but we're also, uh, as I'm showing you today, talking about some of the best known groups out there, things like mammals and birds, uh, butterflies, where uh, we know uh, remarkably little. So if we know so little bit about the planet, uh, 
the rest of the, everything that we build on top of this, our knowledge of basic biology, our understanding of how to prioritize conservation, our cleverness in managing resources, all of that is called into question. And so um, there's a long way to go, uh, and it really matters. It matters especially uh, in a planet where um, things are increasingly endangered. This is a species we named last year. This is an ape. This is an animal we ended up calling the Skywalker Hulot Gibbon. That's a story for another time. Uh, but uh, this is uh, one of 13 species of small apes in the world, about, one of about 18 species of, of apes worldwide. Um, these are our closest relatives. You know, these are the branch on the tree of life of which we are a part. And so this is a species found only in southern China and along the border with Myanmar. There's a couple hundred of those, these individuals left. It had been overlooked. No one had looked close enough to see exactly what kind of gibbon it was. Uh, and like I said, it, an ape that received its scientific name last year. Um, Quickly, one of my favorite examples that, that some of you know about, an animal called, uh, ultimately called the Olinguito. It started where many of these stories start, which is in a natural history museum where I saw some skins like that. Um, thought, for various reasons, looking at skins and bones, that this could be a fuzzy, beautiful, carnivorous animal that didn't seem to have a scientific name, took me on an adventure to the cloud forests of the Andes in, uh, in Colombia and Ecuador, and ultimately um, let me track down this species in the wild, the animal we call the Olinguito. We named this as new to science a few years ago. It's a species of raccoon related to other raccoons, but completely overlooked by scientists and to the extent we were able to understand, even by local people. It looks a little bit like a few other different animals that live in the forest. It's very rare. It only comes out at nights and it only stays up in the trees. Well, Giving this thing a name, putting it into field guides, putting it into uh, protected species plans, all of a sudden we launched um, global knowledge that this thing was even existing and real, and it's got a lot of people interested. This week, um, the Olinguito, just a few years later, is on the cover of Journal Mammalogy. We've published another paper. We're using citizen science data. This has been extraordinary. High school teachers, bird watchers, national park staff who live in the, the range of the Olinguito in Colombia and Ecuador have gotten so interested in this animal that they've uh, launched uh, uh, interest and in, in initiatives to go and see what they can find out about it. So when we first documented it as new to science, we didn't know very much about it. Now uh, information continues to pour in uh, from uh, platforms like iNaturalist, um, citizen science initiatives, but also just organic efforts to every few days I'll get a picture from someone saying, is this, is this an Olinguito? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, but these things, these discoveries um, can interest people, but we can't do this work if we don't know that these things are even there. And maybe it surprises you, maybe not, to know that these kinds of um, undiscovered creatures include animals like this. Um, physics illusions made in biology can go a little too far, but some call these sorts of things, this 80% that Ed Wilson is talking about of unknown biodiversity across the scope of the planet, the, the taxonomic dark matter that's out there. And in a way, that's kind of apt. We know, we, have, we can estimate it, we can see it, we can genetically detect a lot of it, but we still don't know what it is. We don't have names for it. We don't know what these things do for a living. We don't, uh, we don't know really anything about it. And uh, again, that quote, that takes on a remarkable urgency when we think about extinction. And extinction is spread across the whole tree of life, and it's happening in an accelerating manner on a human-dominated planet. Just three examples of animals that, that I know and love. On uh, the left, you see the Sumatran rhinoceros. This is one of the world's largest mammals. This is a, uh, the uh, two-horned rhinoceros of Asia. Uh, there's about, arguably, about 30 left in the entire world. So 100 years ago, these lived in about 12 or 13 countries. Today, they're found only on the island of Sumatra and Borneo, and there's about 30. Um, you see the Javan rhinoceros with one horn there, too. Uh, something like uh, 50 of those in the world, only on the island of Java. Um, kind of perversely, the names we call them, the common names Java and Sumatra, are just sort of 
almost arbitrary labels that were applied a long time ago, and they've become these perverse fates for these animals. Both of these species used to live from India uh, down through to Borneo, and today are only found basically on the islands uh, that were chosen to, the, to be their names. One is only on Java, one is only on Sumatra. Below you see the vaquita, the world's smallest cetacean. This is a species of porpoise in the Gulf of California, Baja California, um, probably fewer than a dozen left today. Incredible impacts, very hard to live as a porpoise in the places where these do. That animal, by the way, wasn't, uh, wasn't discovered and named by scientists till the late 20th century. So even in this part of the tree of life, in the most endangered species, the most charismatic, um, this is part of the dark matter too. So it matters. Of course, we're no strangers to extinction in this country either. And you know, look at that animal and, and be moved, right? I mean, do you feel that? It's extraordinary. What an extraordinary creature. And so it's here. It's here, and we've, we've seen a lot of it in some ways. Um, what we see with things like the porpoise in Mexico or the rhinos in Indonesia, these are just countries that are less far along on their extinction trajectory than, than we already are. Um, as a quick aside, this is an Australian uh, American thylacine, a little bit like, like me. These were sent off to the National Zoo in Washington. And if you look in the back of the, the mother there, you see that there's a little baby with its, with its bum sticking out of the pouch. That's one of the only images we have of what thylacines looked like in their mom's pouch. Uh, one of the most recent mammal extinctions is the Christmas Island Pipistrelle. This is an area, again, where the dark matter aspect was important. Um, I got called in on this case about eight years ago by um, the Federal Ministry for the Environment, and they asked me, to, uh, they said, there's only about a dozen, maybe two dozen, of these pipistrels we believe left on Christmas Island. Um, this is the only insectivorous bat, by the way, on this territory. So it's the only bat for presumably millions of years that's been hawking and eating insects and echolocating over this isolated fragment out in the Indian Ocean for a very long time. But the question was, is it a species unique to the island or not? It had been named about 100 years ago, but no one had really uh, tested that hypothesis. And so um, this was taxonomy under pressure. I uh, very rapidly, in a matter of weeks, went to all the museums in the world that had specimens of the Christmas Island Pipistrelle and the most critical uh, specimens from other islands in Indonesia that which, against which we needed to compare it. We also very quickly had to get our hands from a variety of countries um, to, uh, on samples, of DNA samples, to compare against the pipistrelle. Why had it declined? It's a very Australian story, frankly, about invasive species, rats and crazy ants and wolf snakes and big scolopendra centipedes. All of these things have arrived in Christmas Island in the last 50 to 100 years, and they have absolutely destroyed the native fauna, bats included. We worked fast, and this is hard work. Really, really fine-scale comparisons of skull anatomy, dental anatomy of these really hard-to-tell-apart bats, as well as genetic work done with the team here at the University of Adelaide. Ultimately, we came back and reported that, yes, this thing, by all rights, does deserve to stand as a species unto itself. Its name is Pipistrellus murii, and it's been there on Christmas Island, not interacting evolutionarily with any other bat for probably something like a million years. As we delivered that result that same week, truly, we heard the report back that no more bats were detected echolocating on the island. It hasn't been detected since. This is an extinct species. We didn't know what its name was, and we figured it out not in time. Um, it shows us the, the value of doing this work ahead of time, of knowing what's what, who is where, what these animals do for a living. A quick example from North America, I've been working in my lab on something called white nose syndrome as well. And this is a fungal disease that has wiped out bats in much of, of the United States and Canada, up to 95% mortality in some cave living species. Long story short, this fungus was something native to Europe that jumped over to North America in about 2006. Uh, and took America by storm, taking over caves where these animals roost and hibernate in the winter time. Uh, this species of fungus wasn't named until it started running amok in this way. So it was initially named Geomyces destructans uh, because of the destructive influence it was having on these bats. 
Um, first time it was named, it was moved around to another genus eventually, but this was a, similar to the Christmas Island thing, this was taxonomy under pressure. Scientists trying very, very hard to figure out who is this fungus? What do we call it? Where is it native to? Where does it come from? Why has it come here now? Uh, what does it do for a living? All these basic questions. And that all had to unfold while these bats were dying, and it's been a game of catch-up ever since. Incidentally, this is something um, that is um, uh, understood to potentially be a problem in Australia and something that we're keeping an eye on, uh, something that could come here. One of the last examples I want to give comes from early in my work. It's not this kind of work on dark matter and taxonomy and resolving what these kinds of, of, of organisms are isn't always about naming new species or showing that something has been there a long time. One of my first studies uh, published while I was a student here in Adelaide was on the raccoons of the Caribbean. Um, there are raccoons that uh, were discovered by early European explorers on the islands of the Bahamas, Barbados, and Guadeloupe, out through the Caribbean archipelago. And of course, raccoons were discovered on the American continents too, three different species. But early explorers and taxonomists named these Caribbean raccoons as separate insular populations, and that status remained on the books until about 15 years ago. It never made much sense to me. How did these raccoons get onto these islands, and why were they on such scattered islands? As an undergraduate, I did a study looking at the genetics, the anatomy, and going into archival records to understand um, what I could figure out about the movements of, of people perhaps bringing raccoons in to these islands. And ultimately, we showed uh, that genetically, anatomically, and historically, all three of these Caribbean island populations had been brought within the last three or four hundred years to these islands. They were not native endemic species. They were actually introduced invasive species. They had no rights to be there. And in fact, they were dangerous to animals like ground nesting birds, uh, endemic reptiles. They spread disease. They ate sea turtle nests. And so went down to the governments of these islands and talked to people. And, in Bahamas, and you see on the left, um, the Department of the Environment was only too happy to get this information. They loved it, and they literally made the raccoon the poster child of their invasive species campaign. They say, we hate this animal. We want to get rid of it. This is good information. On Guadeloupe, uh, where the raccoon was the only sort of cuddly, supposedly native mammal, is a French territory, they said, we understand what you're saying. We, we've, we've read the papers, we understand and agree with the science, but we're going to continue uh, to love and cherish our, uh, our raccoon. And so you can still buy it in the uh, gift shops there in the, ra in the airport, and it's still the emblem of their national park system. So uh, you can give information to government, but you can't always you know, predict how it's going to be used. It's also kind of easy to laugh at Guadeloupe and say, well, there's a cuddly species, uh, perhaps you know, in the Australian perspective were jaded with all these invasive species you know how can they how can they love this this recent invader and think that it's a, a separate species even against the science but uh, there's also examples here this is uh, the same kind of story it's close with the story of the dingo this is a beloved Australian animal um, we recently published a paper where we've taken into account as a review all the genetic information, the anatomical information, the historical information, very much like those raccoons, trying to understand what is the dingo. There were many people, um, mostly in, in the world of ecology, that are really enamored with the dingo, and I understand why that is. Um, but they would have as one piece of that kind of appreciation of the dingo, holding it up as a species they call Canis dingo. What we've, what we've shown is that the dingo, uh, for all its uniqueness, is just a, a, a branch along the uh, family tree of the domestic dog. This is something that makes sense. It's only been here for a few thousand years, just like those raccoons there for a few hundred years. You just extend that timeline out a little further. Um, it's just a, a, an example of debate that will continue to rage, but uh, it's the last kind of closing example I'm going to give of this interface between systematics and biodiversity, our efforts to explore and document and understand and organize nature, and how, in very real ways, with a pipistrelle, uh, with a fungus, with um, these raccoons, with an animal like the dingo, all that can all come home to roost together with decisions about conservation, decisions about management, and, uh, and uh, something that all of us need to work together and take into account. Thank you very much.